you know, the West Coast style of blues, you know, based around sort, sort of T-Bone Walker, uh, Charles Brown, you know, and sort of the overriding influence of Nat King Cole and all that. Um, yeah, that's what you grew up hearing, you know. You grew up, you know, even, you know, the black stations, the black stations would play, you know, Soul or this and the other, but once an hour you'd get Charles Brown, you'd get Lowell Folsom, the guys you could go see in the local bars, which my brother Phil and I figured out pretty quick that, uh, you know, sort of around the time we were following the Johnny Otis band around was, oh, we can also go to the York Club on Florence Avenue or Florence and Central, wherever it was, and see T-Bone just playing by himself, you know, with a, with a pickup group. And so that was a, yeah, it was a big influence on, on you know, my brother Phil and I. Um, and then through that and the fact that we were record collectors, um, you know, one thing, you know, you'd, we'd always find Johnny Otis affiliated records. You know, you'd find Double Cross and Blues, Esther Phillips and say, with Johnny Otis Orchestra. Or even Texas stuff, you know, you'd find the uh, early Little Richard stuff with the Johnny Otis Orchestra. You'd find Johnny Ace with the Johnny, he gets around, you know? <laughs> and then you suddenly start realizing, uh, what a big figure he was, you know, um, in the development of R&B and the development of rock and roll. And, you know, just as a, a ranger, producer, talent scout, all that stuff, he's huge, you know? And, um, and, I, and I, you know, Sam Phillips deserves a lot of credit. Ike Turner deserves a lot of credit. Phil and Leonard Chess. But I don't think Johnny Otis gets as, enough credit for what he did. You know, as far as developing Big Mama Thornton, Esther Phillips, you know, I mean, come on. It, you know, by hanging around Big Joe and, and various other people um, when we were kids, we started hearing the stories about Central Avenue and the glory days of Central Avenue in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, from the Club Alabama down down to the Barrel House, the Johnny Otis, Johnny Otis' was own club. And um, there was one night it was really sweet, but, and, you know, we were driving, my brother Phil and I were, I was like 16 and Phil was like 18, and, and we had driven Joe to a gig, and then we were driving him back home at like 2 in the morning, and he said, okay, let's go down Central Avenue, which is out of the way. He went down Central Avenue, and he just pointed out from down where the, way down south of the Barrel House was, all the way up north, up to where the, like, the Lincoln Theater had been. Just, everything, you know, here's the Club Alabama, there was uh, uh, Ivy Anderson's, you know, uh, rib joint or the fried chicken joint, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, kind of steeped in that. Those days were so weird because I lived this double life in that we were going to school, my brother and I, and then we were sneaking out like at least three to four nights a week to go follow guys around or go see, go to either go to Ashgrove or sneak into bars you know, local, local bars. And so it was this weird double life. So it wasn't until years later that, I mean, we knew it was cool and we knew it was special and we knew that there's, you know, there were a few other kids doing it. Michael Mann, later known as Hollywood Fats. You know, it was already, sh shit, he was already in the bands of a lot of these guys. Uh, and there'd be one or two other, uh, you know, white kids doing it, but we knew we were sort of unique in that. And, um, um, But yeah, you know, it wasn't until years later that it kind of dawned. When when guys started passing away, like when, because uh, when you when you have this period of your life where it's like, what do you want to do today? It's Saturday night. What do you want to do? Well, I want to go see Big Joe Turner. Well, I can't. Can't do that anymore. You know. Then you start realizing, oh wait, we we were pretty friggin' lucky. Now, when Big Joe gave us the tour of Central Avenue. I knew then. I was like, this is good. <laughs> you know, this is special. I think that as long as a certain type of blues and rhythm and blues is played, uh, you know, then, like I said, his legacy to me is, is, is as important as the Chess Brothers or Sam Phillips or, you know, Ike Turner and people like that. You know, the guys that really get the credit for being the early rock and roll pioneers. Johnny Otis is right up there with them. There's some Johnny Otis going on in me, you know, and that's about all I can say. You know, but, you know, it's, he did a lot. And so when you think about, I guess anybody that sings, tries to sing like Little Esther Phillips every now and then, or, or you know, 
every time, maybe every time somebody sings Hound Dog, even if they're just doing the Elvis Presley version, there's a little bit of Johnny Otis going out there. So. He'll be around. <laughs> if I could live in a record, uh, Harlem Knocker by the Johnny Otis Orchestra, good record to live in. You know, there's lots of drinks, people are smoking, and the women are all beautiful. And somebody might get hurt. 